morning, we're going through the book of Acts, and the title of today's message is, There's Too Much Evidence. Anybody ever find their way to the dentist, maybe once a year? You get into the dental chair, and as they're working on your, uh, your teeth, your gums, they'll ask a rhetorical question. They'll say, how's the flossing going? <laughs> Obviously, it's rhetorical because your gums are bleeding. They're like, yeah, your gums look a little sensitive. Yeah, you haven't been flossing too much, have you? Maybe you've gone to the doctor, and last year the doctor said, hey, all right, you need to start eating a little better, you know, cut out some of the, the fried stuff, the deep fried stuff, and maybe you start your, you know, exercise regimen. So you go in to see the doctor, and the doctor says, hey, so how was the exercise and good eating going? Obviously a rhetorical question, because you stepped on the scale, and there was too much evidence that you weren't following any regiment at all. Do we have any campers in here? Love camping? No, let me back up a little bit. I'm not talking about driving in your RV, <laughs> air conditioning, satellite TV, a, a microwave and an oven. I'm talking about you put a tent up. You're out there in the elements. All right. You know what I love about camping? I love some s'mores, making some marshmallows and some s'mores and all of that good stuff. But what I also like about camping is uh, being around the campfire, having some worship, having some fellowship. You know what's interesting? You can tell that a person has been around a campfire by what? Smell. The smell. There's too much evidence. What I hear about a campfire is that it gets in your clothes, it gets in your hair. I wouldn't know that one, obviously. <laughs> But no matter where you go, you can smell that they've been around a campfire. You go home and you're like, man, there's smoke all over you. Why? Because you were next to the campfire. We didn't see all the, the, the smoke enveloping us. We didn't see that. We were just around the campfire having some worship and talking. But while we were close to the campfire, all of the campfire was doing this all over us. So much so that it got in our clothes, got in your hair. So no matter where you went, someone said, you've been camping because I, I smell you. <laughs> Today in our, our text, John and Peter are before the religious. And the religious, they smell some Jesus on them. The religious are going to say, you've, you've been around this, this Jesus guy. How wonderful would it be, family, if you and I just surrounded ourselves with Jesus all the time, just, just nestled up right next to him, that people would say, you've been with some Jesus, haven't you? I smell Jesus like all around you. He's in your clothes. He's in your hair. He's coming out of your mouth. I smell, I smell Jesus. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, and if not, there is one in front of you. Unless you're in the front row, there is not one in front of you. <laughs> Acts chapter 4. What a beautiful book we've been going through. Acts chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 13 through 22. And when you get there, give me an amen. amen. Good job, everybody. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then the book of Acts chapter 4. And it says this. And if you need some help finding it, turn to the front page of your Bible. There's a little uh, table of contents with a page number. Acts chapter 4, starting at verse 13. Looks like this, family. It says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed a notable miracle has been done through them. It's evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. Verse 17. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them, that from now on they speak to no man in this name. 
So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered, and they said to them, whether it is right in the sight of, in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we can only speak of the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. Listen to this, verse 22. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. Today I want to share with you the blessed evidences of being with Jesus. The first point this morning is being with Jesus changes you. Amen? Amen. Being with Jesus changes you. All of us, or most of us, are probably here this morning, unless you were drug here, because Jesus has changed you. You see, at 1020, if Jesus hasn't changed us, we could find a bunch of other things to do. We could sleep in, praise the Lord for that. We could be eating, praise the Lord for that too. But because of what Jesus has done in you, I'm going to go to church and worship some Jesus because of what God has done. The religious are saying, these guys are untrained and uneducated. They've been with Jesus. I mean, what a wonderful compliment. They're saying, these guys didn't go to our schools. These guys weren't trained by our teachers, but there's something about them that's different. That's what I love following Jesus, is that we don't have to be crazy, different, but different in the sense that we know that God has come in and has given us hope that he's transformed us, that he has given us life. So we, we come to church just to, to praise Jesus because something has taken place in our lives. The religious are saying, hey, how are these two fishermen doing what they're doing? There's something different, different about them. Remember that they have been with Jesus for three years, hearing the best sermons, hearing, hey, Jesus, teach us how to pray. Jesus, what do we do with this thing called unforgiveness? Jesus, guess what? You've given us power, and we've gone out. The 72 have gone out, and we're laying hands on people, and they're recovering, waking up. Hey, Jesus, I have a question for you. How do I work this out in my life? Three years of being with Jesus, seeing all of these great miracles, but yet the religious say that they are untrained and uneducated. You see, being with Jesus is better than being in any seminary. You see, a seminary is not going to give you what the disciples had in Jesus. So the religious are going, there's something different about these guys. You see, they have been changed. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, he says this, live in such a way that men may recognize that you have been with Jesus. Live in such a way that people can say, there's, there's something different. There's something different about you. You see, when we decide that we want more of Jesus, things in our lives tend to change. Take a left turn where you are and find yourself in Luke chapter 10. When we've been with Jesus, it changes you. And while you're turning there to Luke chapter 10 at verse 38, Jesus is going to find himself in a certain lady's home having a little Bible study. But things didn't go well for all the parties there in the home. Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 38, it says, it says this. Everybody there? Amen. All right, Luke 10, 38. It says, now what happened, as they went, he, speaking of Jesus, he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. Uh-oh, ladies. Can you imagine Jesus coming to your house? Who is it? Jesus. You got to wait a minute. I've got to clean up my house. You're going to start throwing dishes in the oven, throwing stuff in the closet. Jesus has come to my house. It says, and she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached Jesus and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me alone to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me, Jesus. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. 
But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. The creator of the universe is in your house, and you're worried about serving. You're worried about cleaning. Think about this. Any ladies like that? That's probably like you, huh? Jesus comes over. You're going to freak out, aren't you? Oh, my God, Jesus is here. The house is not clean. You're going to start vacuuming stuff. We're breathing everything. Your house would never be clean enough for Jesus. He's perfect. You can do all you're going to do, and he can still go, it's not clean enough. Maybe I should go to another house. <laughs> Jesus is there at Martha's house, and she's worried about a clean house. The one who spoke in the universe came into existence is in your living room, and you are worried about a, a, a dirty house. Does that not shock anybody else? I'm thinking the man is in your living room, and yet, you're doing everything else but sitting at his feet. I mean, if Jesus came into my house, I would say, I have two big dogs, Jesus. Just sit right here. Let me get my pen and paper because I want to learn from whatever you got to say. Move the stuff aside. I, I just want to be with you. I just want to hear what you have to say. But, but Martha's like, here's your hors d'oeuvres. Here's your hors d'oeuvres. Is anybody else thirsty in here? And Mary's just like this. Martha's this. Mary's like, oh, that's a great point, Jesus. Man, this is awesome. How are you doing, Martha? You're good? Okay, you're doing fine. <laughs> Martha's like, I need help, Jesus. So she says, Jesus, tell her to stop being lazy and help me. Jesus says, Martha, Martha. That's like your parents saying your whole name. You know you're blessed then. Martha, Martha. You're worried about all of these things, but Mary has chosen what's best. Sitting at Jesus' feet or cleaning house. God, help us. Mary wanted to be changed. She, she chose what's best to, to sit at Jesus' feet and to, to learn of him. Why? Because Jesus brings about this change that we need. No matter how clean your house is, How's that going to change you? Guess what? It's going to get dirty again tomorrow. Mary says, let me just sit at the feet of Jesus. Let me just soak in Jesus, and her life would be different. Our lives haven't been different from clean houses, but our lives have been different with Jesus. Amen. So I encourage you guys, if you haven't already, pray about opening up your home to a life group. Because guess what? As Brother Noel said, where two or more gathered in his name, guess who's there? Jesus is going to be in your house when you have a life group. You might be thinking, my house is dirty. Who cares? No amens for that one. These ladies are going, I care. I care, I care a lot, pastor man. <laughs> my prayer is that you won't care so much to not allow your house to be used for God's kingdom. You know, like, who, who walks through a house saying, man, I can't believe this place is dirty. Do we do that? At least hopefully we shouldn't do that. <laughs> Just don't say it out loud. But just that you have a house that God wants to use to fill his, with his presence. I think that's a phenomenal opportunity just for us to say, God, my house isn't immaculate. It's not, you know, 100% clean. It's not going to pass the white glove test. But you are welcome that people might learn of you. Jesus is there in Martha's home, and she's worrying about dishes and serving. And oh, my goodness. God, help us. You see, being with Jesus, it... It changes us. John the Baptist said this in John 3.30. John says that he must increase, but I must decrease. See, there's too much of us in us. No amens for that one, huh? You're like, uh, move it along, pastor man. <laughs> there's too much of Henry in Henry. Once in a while, my wife would say, you know what? Uh, there's a lot of you in you right now. You know, maybe you need to go on a walk with Jesus and you guys fix some stuff because there's just too much of you and you. We need more of Jesus in that guy. We need to have more of Jesus in us. John says that Jesus, he's got to increase and I'm the one that, that has to, to decrease. That there must be more of Jesus in me than, than me in me. And how wonderful it is, family. We see this in the lives of the disciples. 
there's more of Jesus in them, so much so that the religious are going, there's something different about these guys. What a wonderful compliment. You're acting like Jesus. You've been with that Jesus guy again. Yes, I have. Praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians tells us like this. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. The religious are going, how is this even possible? (laughs) These guys are uneducated and untrained. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. I get excited with stuff like that. God chooses the foolish things. He chooses the weak things. They're like, I don't know what God is doing, but I know that guy. And look what God does through this simple vessels like you and me. That's what I like, that God is not a respecter of persons, that God doesn't say, well, you're different. Oh, you're different. Well, you're not really there yet. Oh, you're getting there. No, he just says to all who will come, he'll do great things in little vessels like us. All of us are jacked up in our own little special way. But God still says, I want to use you for my kingdom without limit. He says, just simply step out, and he's going to do some great things. Peter and John <coughs> excuse me, are simply fishermen. And look what God is doing. So as we continue to spend time in God's word, have Jesus on our lips. We sing about Jesus. We pray to Jesus. The more we're going to act like him and act less like ourselves. Just maybe... You've got kids who are going to say, you know what, mom and dad are different. Grandma and grandpa are, are different. Now, there's something different about them. Maybe it's the Jesus guy. Well, verse 14, it says, And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. We have number or letter A. There is power available. Little kids, little kids, grandkids, you know how they can't stand still? They're just always just fidgeting around. And you're like, stop moving. Just stand still. So this man was over 40 years old, and he was crippled from birth. Peter raised him up. The Bible says he leaped up, jumped up, full of joy. This guy is in the midst of them. I wonder if he was going, I can't believe that. Look at that. Look at that. Oh, man, I got ankles. My ankles work. Look at my toes are moving. The religious are very serious. But this guy is just in the middle. I wonder if he was going, I can't believe these knees work. This is what happens when you bend your knees. Just jumping around and the religious are going, well, what name are you doing this? And this guy is just, I can't believe I can walk. There is the evidence that was right there in front of them. And they're saying, there is nothing that we can do to, to deny this. The bad part is, the religious saw this man was transformed but they didn't want to know how or why. They they didn't want to know for themselves. A miracle has happened. I want that miracle for my life. They didn't want to know. I ask myself, how is this possible that they can see a, a life that was transformed even before their eyes? They knew this guy. How is it they did not want to know this, this power? Maybe in your life, you need some of this, this power. You read the Bible and you're thinking, man, I would, I would love to have some power that's available. Well, guess what? There is power that's available for us. This man is a wonderful witness of the power of God. He was, spent, what, he was born, what, 40, 40 plus years where he was crippled. And then just one day, God had this wonderful, wonderful plan. This man was standing in front of them as a witness to the power of God. Well, verse 15 through 17, it says, But when they commanded them to go outside of the council, they conferred amongst themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed, a notable miracle has been done to them, and it is evidence to all who dwell in Jerusalem, for we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. What do we have here, B? We have man's schemes will fail. They're saying, what can we do? Well, there's nothing we can do to deny this because everyone sees that this man is is healed. Why would you want to deny something like this? 
this is a beautiful moment in this man's life. Why would you try to deny this? I talked to you last week that not everybody that walks next to you is on your side. Not everybody wants to see you happy. Have you noticed that? Not everybody is excited about the things that excite you. You call somebody all excited. They're like, you know it's not going to last. Anybody ever say, yeah, you got friends like that. Hit delete. <laughs> Click unfriend. This is just the phase you're going through. It's not going to last. You know, you've been through this before. Yeah, it's just the phase. They're like, hey, you know what? God bless you, and I'll talk to you in about 10 years. <laughs> Click. It's not going to last. Not everybody wants to see you succeed. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus was resurrected. And then the religious, they say, you know what? Well, let's read that. Matthew 28, starting at verse 11. The religious say, it says, now while they were going, it says, behold, some of the guard came into the city and they reported to the chief priest all the things that had happened. When they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, what did they do? They gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, tell them that his disciples came at night and stole him away while he slept. The greatest moment in human history, they're bribing people. It says, and if it comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. If you lose a prisoner or somebody in your care, you were to die. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. They wanted to cover up what God had done. They wanted to explain it away. But what are Peter and John doing here? They're not denying what Jesus Christ has done. Man's schemes will always fail. If you read the book of Esther, Haman had a plan. He had a scheme, but it came to nothing. The Bible says that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. That means as people are plotting your demise, God has a better and a greater plan. The Bible says in Acts chapter 5, as they were trying to silence what the disciples were doing. I believe Gamaliel says this. He says, And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. That's what excites me. That if this plan is of God. No one or no thing will be able to stop it. Nothing. If it's not from God, then it's just going to just go like this. But if it's from Jesus, oh, 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 that's exciting. That means no matter what happens, it belongs to God. That if Calvary Beaumont is a work of God, it is going to fulfill God's purpose for it. That's why we don't hit eject when things start going a little bad, because we know that this is the work of God. When you open up your home, that is a work of God. And if God be for us, amen, good job, church. So if God is with us, no matter what goes on, this is the work of God. We can find some joy and some peace knowing that if God is for us, no one can be against us. That, what did Gamaliel say? He says, if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it lest you even be found to fight against God. Wouldn't that be a scary thing to fight against God? Well, he goes on to say, so that it spreads no further. Did you know we have an adversary? Our adversary wants to make sure that Jesus spreads no further in your life. He wants to make sure that Jesus doesn't spread it in your life. Just keep them kind of in an infantile state. Keep them kind of on the milk of stuff so they're not overly concerned about. Just maybe find themselves just kind of content with things. That Jesus spreads no further. Have you noticed that when you have a free hour or a free day, 
you're thinking of things like honey-do list. What can I do to go have some fun? Which is, you know, nothing wrong with those two things. But when was the last time we had a free day or something and we said, but let's go up to, to what is it, Oak Glen up here? Let's go up to Oak Glen and take our Bible and a notepad and some, some, uh, a pen and go sit on a rock or something and read our scriptures and see what God's going to say to us. You see, Satan would say, well, just keep them content with just kind of coming to church and just hanging out and, and not really doing anything. Let's just keep them in, a, in, a, in an infantile state where it's just okay. What if? What if God would have us to, to grow to maturity? God would have us to be strong. God would have us to go set this place on fire for Jesus. But it's going to cost us something. Maybe we're just a little too, little too busy. Got some bills going on, some working. I got to hit the gym. What about dinner and the kids and meetings and my mom is crazy? All of those things. I'm sure none of you guys have a crazy mother-in-law, right? That never, ever happens. So that it spreads no further. So that Jesus spreads no further in your life, Satan will keep you very, very busy. Just keep them busy. Yeah, they'll be so busy with, with all of their, their stuff. They'll be busy with all of their there are things that, yeah, they won't make any, any dent for the, the kingdom of God. Hebrews chapter 5, <clears throat> excuse me, we believe uh, Paul wrote it, but listen to what he says in verse 12. He says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. Jump down to verse one of chapter six. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, he says, let us go on to perfection. Leaving the, the, the elementary stuff, leaving the milk, going on to the, the more meatier things of following Jesus. How many of you have, is your memory kind of mas o menos? <laughs> You're like, you know, I'm getting a little older, I'm climbing that hill, and the mind is not what it used to be. But if I asked you to sing me your favorite song from 1955, <laughs> I bet you you can quote that. You'll probably get a little hitch. <laughs> probably get the head going a little bit. There is nothing wrong with our memories. Nothing wrong. You can remember the tune right now. There is nothing wrong with your memory. We have to decide to memorize some scripture because this is a wonderful computer. We just got to shove it with some good stuff. Most of you watch the news or you go online and you have all of this useless information in your mind. But what if we said, okay, I'm going to memorize one verse a week. I'm going to put it on a little note card. It'll be in my car. It'll be in my wallet. It'll be in my purse. It'll be in my refrigerator. It'll be in my living room. It'll be in my bathroom. Just one scripture a week. I bet you we could do that. Amen? This is our, this is our homework. Be still and know that I'm God. That's your homework. I'm going to ask you next week if I don't forget. Here's my mind, right? <laughs> It is so important, family, to follow Jesus, to get the scripture, get the scripture in our mind, because so often we can just walk with Jesus for 5, 10, 15, 20 years and still not grow. So I encourage you, step out of your boat, whatever boat you might be in, step out of the boat. Say, Jesus, let's, let's do something different. It's 2018. I want to follow you like I've not followed you before. Well, verse 17, so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. What is this name? It's this name that has given us hope, this name that has given us peace, this name that has transformed us, this name that every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. This name in which this crippled man was made whole, the religious are saying, speak no longer in this name. But it's by this name of Jesus that we are, we are held. Listen to what the Bible says in Colossians. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. 
and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Just maybe we need to keep this name on our lips. If, if all things that were created by him and for him, we need to keep the name of Jesus on our lips. That's why before we eat a meal, thank you, Jesus. Before we go to bed, thank you, Jesus. When we wake up, thank you, Jesus. When we come to church, we sing to Jesus, we pray to Jesus, we read about Jesus. Why? Because it's this name that is above every, every name. Does anybody ever have a storm come through your life once or twice? A couple of you. Amen to that. Maybe you're in one this morning. In Matthew chapter 8, the disciples were, were in a storm, and it says this. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? They're, they're in a boat, and, and Jesus is, is sleeping. Jesus, we're going to die. Don't you care? So they wake up Jesus. Yeah, we're about to die. We, we, need, we need some help. Jesus is sleeping in the storm. The storm is raging, and he's asleep. The disciples are going, this is not good for us. Go wake up Jesus. Jesus is like, we're not going to die in a storm. My father sent me here to die on a cross, not in a boat. But Jesus stands up and he, he stills the storm. He says, just be still, be, be still. What does that teach the disciples? They're going, there's something different about this, this Jesus. Who, who is it that even the wind and the sea obey him? If the wind and the sea obey him, and he's given us his name to use, we should... Maybe some of you need to stand up in the storm of your life and say, just peace, be still in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, just be still, just be still. Peace be upon this issue in my life. Well, verse 18 through 20, it says, So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered, and they said to them, Whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you more than the God you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. We have lastly number two. Being with Jesus is undeniable. Being with Jesus is undeniable. I can't but tell you of what I've seen and what I have heard. I can't deny what I know. I can't deny what I've experienced. None of us are, are Bible scholars. But we're wonderful testimonies of the goodness of God. You see, I remember me before Jesus. Not so good. Not such a good guy. Because of the power of God, I'm here this morning. And many of you can attest the same thing. Because the power of God in your life, how can we deny it? How can we say, well, I am where I am because, you know, I've got a master's degree and I have all of these things and because I'm a good speaker and all this. I know 24 years ago the man that I was. And just because of the, the, the transformative power of Jesus Christ, I, I can't deny that he's real. I can't explain everything. I don't know Hebrew. I don't know Greek. But I know I've been changed. I, I know that... This man, Jesus, loved me and gave himself for me. I know that he took away all of these issues I used to have. I know that I was without hope one day, and he came in and, and he gave me hope. I, I can't explain how he created the sun and the moon and the universe. I, 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 I don't know, but I know he's changed me. I, I know that he's, he's spoken to me. I, I, I know that he's transformed my life. These disciples are saying, you want us to, to not talk about the guy who changed us? All we can do is tell you about what we've, what we've heard and what we've seen. What a wonderful testimony that all of us have. All of you used to be something. Amen? Now you should be something completely different than what you used to be. That's a testament of the power of God. Because we, we try to change ourselves from time to time, right? We're like, you know what, okay, I'm going to change myself. I'm going to use some willpower. What, last about a week, week or two? 
how's the diet going is like the, is the question. You know, it's, it's January, right? You're like, well, it's, it's February. It's February now. You're like, January, I'm going to do this new thing. You did good for a little while, right? Until you found yourself at Olive Garden. <laughs> You're like, you know, I know I shouldn't have, you know, creamy stuff. I know I shouldn't have these breadsticks. I'm just going to have the salad. Mm-hmm. Those buttery breadsticks made their way to your table, and out goes that new diet. It's this, yeah, next year. Yeah, then the next year after that. But being with Jesus is simply undeniable. First John says it to us like this. It says, that which was from the beginning, which is who? Jesus. Good job. Good job, guys. That which was from the beginning, you can also read the Gospel of John, chapter 1, says the same thing. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen, and we bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. John is saying, we've, we've handled we, we've heard, we've, we've seen this, this Jesus guy, and we can't, we can't deny it. Family, there are several reasons why we can believe that Jesus is, existed. No one's going to die for what they willingly know is a lie. No one is going to die for what they willingly know is a lie. They could have just said, you know what? You're going to kill us? Hey, we're just kidding. We didn't see this Jesus guy. We don't know who he is. They didn't do that. They said we can simply testify that we've seen Jesus. We've handled him. We've been with him. We've walked with him for three years. We've seen this power because this power has, has transformed us, and we can't deny that he has changed us. So what did they go on to say? So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. It's in the verse 22. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. Last point for this morning is God has a plan. In my mind, I'm thinking, God, the man is over 40 years old. He's, he's, he's born, born crippled. Why not, A, just create him without having this, this issue? I mean, Jesus, why not heal him at year five? Why not heal him at year 10? Why not year 15? God, what are you doing? God, we know you're all powerful. We know you're all merciful. So why this man, more than 40 years, he's crippled. Why don't you, why don't you do something about it? Isaiah helps us out with questions like these. God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see what's great about this story, family, is Jesus healed this man at the right place, at the right time, and at the right season. You see, it was Pentecost. We learned several weeks ago that the whole world came to Jerusalem. So the whole world is there at Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost. Then the Holy Spirit is poured out. There's a big crowd there going, what's going on? Peter preaches Jesus. 3,000 of them come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. P uh, Peter and John go to church. There happens to be a man crippled from his mother's womb that's there day after day, week after week, year after year. And just happened that Peter and John walked past him. The man is begging for alms. Peter says, silver and gold I don't have for you, but in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. The Bible says he leaped up, jumped up, went into church, praising God. We learned last week, 5,000 people, just men, so probably 10,000, maybe even 15,000 people received Jesus as their Savior from this man being crippled. So we would say, Pentecost happened at the right time. All the people were in the right place at the right time. The crippled man was at the right place at the right time. Peter and John were at the right place and the right time. Because of this man, 5,000 people are going to spend eternity with Jesus. 
Now, we would be thinking, God, why not fix him sooner, heal him sooner? But it wasn't time. Listen to what the Bible says. Great, great scripture. It says, he made, he made everything beautiful when? In its time. Any planters or flower people here? You like to plant stuff? All right, you plant some seeds. You don't put a seed in the ground and go back out there tomorrow saying, okay, why is it not growing? You water it again. Use some miracle grow. Maybe that's going to help. Why is it not growing? You go out there the next day, the next day. You're waiting for it to, to, to come up. You're, you're waiting for, for something beautiful to happen. But do you notice that around this plant, there's a bunch of rocks, a bunch of, a bunch of dead stuff? He makes all things beautiful in its time. Around this place is a bunch of charred things, but look what God does with disaster. Look what he does with burned things, dead things. Maybe your life resembles the dead things around here. Maybe you're going, I don't know what's going on, God. But what if just under the ground, this little seed is just about ready to, to pop up? What if God is just, just about to do something. Just that seed is about to just, just bloom. Something beautiful like that. It's in God's time. The crippled man was healed in God's time. This crippled man's life was for the praise and glory of Jesus. He used this man to save 5, 10, 15,000 people. We would think, God, just fix this man. He's suffering. He's suffering. Do something in his suffering, Jesus. Come on, why make him suffer? Because God's plan is right here, and our thoughts are right here. God, just get me out. God, get me out. Fix me, change me, fix me, change me. But maybe God's plan for you is right here. Maybe God wants to use you as a testimony. Maybe God is going to do something great with us like he did with the man in the story. The man is going, I'm just happy that I'm walking now. But 5,000 people we're going, hey, we know that guy. We know that guy. He's walking and leaping. God help us to be mindful of his plan, even in our pain. Amen. Be mindful of the plan of God, even in our pain. Let me give you a couple of things. One thing to take home. Schedule a time to be with Jesus. Schedule a time. What? We schedule our vacations. We schedule appointments. We don't just jump in and do things. We schedule these things. So we need to schedule our time with Jesus. So there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, I'm going to go spend some Jesus time. If anybody calls for me, let them know I'm busy. Let them know I'm unavailable. The world will not fall apart if you don't answer your cell phone. <laughs> they need me. They need me. They'll be okay for about a half hour to an hour. You get yourself alone with Jesus, and great things are going to happen. Just get yourself alone with Jesus with a notepad and some paper and a pen. Jesus, I need to be with you. I need to spend more time with you. And as we spend more time with Jesus, it's going to change us. Someone's going to say, you're acting different. You're not a jerk anymore. You're not mean anymore. Keep your appointments going. Keep your appointments going. I like this new you. You keep spending time with Jesus. Because as we spend more time with Jesus, the more we're going to be like him. And I'm sure you, just like me, I want to be more like Jesus than I want to be more like Henry. Henry is like Jesus all the time, loving and consistent. Well, we are at the place of communion this morning, which is so beautiful. It's a special time for us believers. We are to remember God's greatest gift to us and for us. We are to remember that we have this great love found in Jesus Christ. We are to remember the sacrifice that he made to set us free and to, to give us hope. We are to remember that we are some great sinners, but we have a, a great Savior that is greater than all of our sin. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrated his love towards us 
in that while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is such good news. So communion is a time where we remember the sacrifice of Jesus, that if there was any other way to save us, God would have provided that way. But there was no other way for you and I to be rescued, for our souls to be saved, than for Jesus to die on a cross. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. This morning, as we pass out the communion elements, 